I have noon on my watch here, so we are going to get started. We welcome you to Improving Employee Wellbeing, which is being co-hosted by the Quinlan School of Business and the Parkinson School of Health Sciences and Public Health here at Loyola University, Chicago. I'm Seth Green, and I'm proud to be the founding director of the Bonhart Center here at Loyola. And I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of what we're gonna be up to this afternoon before turning it over to my awesome colleague, Elaine Morado. She'll be speaking, as you can see at the top here, and giving a strategic overview. Then we're gonna be hearing an expert perspective from Benjamin Miller, the Chief Strategy Officer of the Wellbeing Trust. And then we're gonna be going into case studies of how businesses and organizations are specifically approaching well-being in this challenging time. We'll hear from Lourdes Gonzalez, who is the Director of People at Farmers Fridge, and from Tanya Haramilla, the COO of Urban Gateways. And then we're gonna be taking your questions. So start thinking of them now. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to our founding dean, Elaine Morado, to provide a welcome and an overview of what we're going to be discussing on this call. Thank you very much, Seth. And thank you for everyone that's take, taking time out of your day to, to listen and to learn um, with the guests that we have with us next. I thought I could do next, uh, Seth, just to ground us. Um, for those of you who might have listened in on some of our uh, series in the spring, this is our continuation of our journey together on a roadmap to recovery um, in the times of COVID-19. And, and I was pulling up this slide just to kind of remind myself where, where have we come? Um, you know, in the spring, uh, great emphasis on flattening the curve. And then as various states and institutions have been opening over the summer and into the fall, we, we clearly are seeing in the news variation in terms of case rate and, and, and that. And really we're, we're continuing now in that state of opening and protection um, as we head into the holiday season. Um, and so that's where we are today. And we thought no better time now than to talk about our mental wellness resiliency as we proceed through the, this roadmap and pandemic together. Next. So just a couple of grounding principles of why Parkinson is partnered with Quinlan School of Business. And it's because Seth and I and others believe that really our collective response to the COVID-19 pandemic requires both community health as well as economic resiliency. And to do that and to accomplish it, we have to be leveraging strong cross-sectoral collaborations and coordinations amongst individuals, employers, schools, government agencies, the private sector, as well as our healthcare and first responders. And so this is what has inspired us to make sure that in each talk, we bring to you both the perspective of expertise from health, and then the application and integration of that knowledge into practice, into community uh, organizations or businesses as well. And so um, that is what we hope to accomplish. Next slide. Um, I always like to ground it as well with where are we right now in the epidemic? And so I pulled up for us a reminder of where we are on the stats, the epidemiology. Uh, we know that cases are increasing. We see this in the news. We know that with cases, the increase in deaths is following. I, I highlight here, these are, this is a map from the New York Times and Hotspot, and you can really see where we are and north of us in Wisconsin are particularly in an upsurge and hotspot area. For those in Chicago, we've seen some increased um, precautions uh, and reg um, regulations going into place. And for those of us listening in the news internationally, we hear our colleagues in Europe um, going into more uh, locked on. So, so we're anticipating that we're entering into the winter season with an upsurge. Um, and listening to uh, Dr. Fauci, you know, this is not going to go away in, in a short term. And so how we think about our resiliency mentally as well as physically is really important as we navigate through this together. Next. And it's not just the pandemic. It's important to remind ourselves because it's ever present what's going on outside of our the pandemic lens, um, what we're hearing in the election cycle, um, the cry for racial justice, um, the... The, um, the environmental impacts of fires hitting many uh, today. I, I believe um, the Hurricane Zeta is hitting ground in Louisiana, the third this season. 
and collectively the impact on us economically. I know the Wall Street Journal just published that as we look at tax revenue, we may be facing another Great Depression type environment. So this, this weighs very heavily. It's not just getting through physically, but how do we get through mentally as well? Um, and I'm just gonna close with the next slide to say, how do we remain hopeful? Um, and I, I love this picture. I took it in the spring when I was in lockdown and, and walking around downtown Chicago and came across this. And I find it really a touchstone. There's a lot to be hopeful for. Um, there's progress being made to on the vaccine. Much has been learned in healthcare treatment in order to do better in, in reducing mortality rate. And what we wanna focus on today is the hope in, in applying the knowledge and expertise around mental health resiliency. So that too can be part of our, our mix and bring it together for our collective resiliency. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Ben Miller. Um, I was privileged to get to work with Ben when I was at the University of Colorado, and he was the founding director for the Eugene Farley Health Policy Center. Um, he uh, is now our ch the chief strategy officer at Wellbeing Trust, a national foundation committed to advancing the mental, social, and spiritual health of our nation. He's been very involved in setting policy and health policy um, in mental health area on initiatives to integrate behavioral and primary care together and is a lead author on a report done by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, considering the culture of whole health and specifically setting direction to advance mental health. Um, he's currently an adjunct professor at Stanford. Stanford. So we're delighted to have you here, um, Ben, and I'm gonna turn over the mic to you. Thank thanks, you. Elaine, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna go pretty rapidly through a bunch of slides and I wanna try and really lay claim to this important moment that I think we've all been given. Uh, so next slide for me, Seth. I'm just gonna throw out some words here, folks. Mental health, addiction, racism, climate change, COVID, technology, death, despair, elections, innovation, resilience, opportunity, hope, change. These are the words that I don't know about you go through my head almost every day. When I get done at whatever time I get done, stepping away from the computer, I feel this, this strong um, sense of urgency to get a lot of things right. But the fact is that most of us right now are confronting issues that are quite big, uh, quite strong. And what I wanna do today on the next slide is to talk a little bit about this moment that's been given to us for reflection. So these words go through my head as probably often as they go through yours. And if you're anything like me, uh, you've probably had some personal reflection as well as you've had professional reflection about where we spend our time and what we spend our, our resources on. Um, I think it's really given us a moment to really show in this country what's worked and what's not worked. Next slide, please. And what's not working is that far too many Americans are dying from preventable causes. Um, each time we make progress in this space, it seems like new problems appear. Uh, the slide in front of you are what we call the deaths of despair and they've been increasing for almost two decades. These are deaths to drug overdose, alcohol or suicide and they're driven very little by healthcare factors and more, more often by socio socioeconomic factors. The US has been working to address them without much success, as you can see here from the trends. Take the case of opioid overdose. It's something that I know uh, many of us have worked on. Just as we were beginning to get a handle on the misuse of prescription opioids in 2018, fentanyl and synthetic opioids came to the foreground. Uh, two decades ago, these drugs were linked to fewer than 1,000 deaths each year. And in 2017, those synthetic opioids killed more than 28,000 Americans. So we're not doing something right. Next slide, please. Nearly 72,000 Americans died from drug overdose in 2019, which is a 5% increase from 2018. And deaths from drug overdose deaths, this, this blows my mind every time I say this, it, it, they remain higher than the peak year death total ever recorded for accidents, um, for car accidents, guns, or AIDS. And their acceleration in recent years has pushed down the overall life expectancy in the US. And 2020 could get a lot worse. Drug deaths have risen an average of 13% so far this year over last year, according to mortality data that was collected by the New York Times. And really, if this trends continue for the rest of this year, it will be the sharpest increase in annual drug deaths for some time. A research that we've done has shown that because of the rates in unemployment, some of the economic decline, especially in specific communities, social isolation, numbers around drugs, alcohol, and suicide deaths may only con continue to grow exponentially over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So I'm a big fan of calling out structural issues when structures don't work, faulty foundations. 
And our structures often reinforce this fragmented view of our health. It seems that the calling card for mental health for the last two decades has really been integration. And we fail pretty bad at that. It's still our North Star, it's our goal. We have to work somehow to make access and care easier. Why integrate? Well, first of all, let's just consider for a second what fragmentation does. I mean, eight out of 10 workers with a mental health condition, and these are employees, do not seek mental health care due to shame and stigma. Divisions divide and people often don't seek care when they have to work harder for that care or see that it's different than where they might go for their medical care. Integrating mental health more seamlessly brings it into the places that people are, their workplaces, places like primary care and schools. So I wanna offer four themes that I think should permeate any discussion that we have around mental health, around resiliency, that can really facilitate our ability to recover. Next slide, please. So number one, we have perpetuated and in some cases codified this wrong door problem. One of the biggest mistakes we've made in our understanding of health is that people should have to come to us, to a clinic, to a hospital to get help. Sure, there's times that that's necessary, but imagine what would happen if we switched that around to where help actually came to you. Bringing care to people wherever they are should be the new norm. If COVID has taught us anything, it's that we can reach more people when we leverage our creative juices to get care to them. Why not make this the new norm? I mean, right now, if we just think of our phones, the number of times that many of you have probably talked to your physician, clinician, mental health worker, or whatever on your phone that we didn't do before COVID. Next slide, please. On this slide here, you can see what Wellbeing Trust has created with several others around a framework for excellence. Um, we've put this forward and we've called it a framework because we think it, we think that it, it really uh, highlights the importance of bringing mental health into every place that people show up with mental health needs. If you look at the left-hand side here though, that begins in community. It begins with where you live. It begins with certain community conditions, what some people call social determinants. And on the orange column, you could see that why wouldn't we wanna have mental health where in our jails, in our prisons, in our workplaces. Next slide, please. So uh, let's, number two, let's redefine health and make sure that our, our technologies and our tools will serve the system that we want, not the system that we have. And this is a key thing here for me. I don't think it's a surprise for anyone that's on this webinar today to say that we've strayed just a little bit from the truest definition of health, which is, I've always used is the foundation for our achievement. We wait till we're sick or illness is set in before the system steps in to help. We require diagnoses or prior authorization to get people into mental health care. We wait until the problem is big enough before we allow a person in so that we can help them. Why not allow healthcare to actually invest in health by proactively engaging at the times it matters to people, early, often, and as comprehensive as one can make it? For me, the workplace really allows for this. I mean, people spend more time at work than they do at home most days. At least, say, well, now we can't tell because we're all working from home. And so our workplaces are our homes, at least many of us are. And I think this is where employers can do a lot. They can embrace things like digital solutions to give employees new tools to meet them where they're at. So they don't have to leave work and you know, take time off to go see somebody. Um, but we can't do any of that if we don't raise the bar. Next slide, please. We have to raise the bar and set a standard for what we expect. Um, we can do a lot of things for mental health, but it needs to be codified by this greater expectation that we have for what we can do for mental health. So let's the raise the bar on what we expect from, from our employers for mental health, and let's drive standards that are looking at evidence and what good could look like for an employee. Next slide, please. Number four, let's exnovate. I love this term. I, I love, you probably use this word five times a day. I think it's the best word ever. And if you're not familiar with it, I'll, I'll teach you about it here. Um, sometimes innovation stands in the way of innovation. And that may seem redundant and counterintuitive, but exnovation is really the removal of a previous innovation that allows for a new innovation to do its work, to have the impact it can truly have without having to work through all the, the kind of the scar tissue of previous innovations. It's re removing innovations that are not effective and improving your goal, your overall organizational performance, um, or something that it just might be too disruptive uh, for you to remove that innovation. And so you keep it there. Um, we found though that in you, when you don't remove those innovations, what happens is that the new idea never really gets as much traction as it could. So we have to excavate, get rid of some of these old innovations. And I could spend hours, I know I don't have much time left, but we could spend hours talking about this in the mental health employer space. But let's just say, for example, like uh, there's a ton of innovations that I think we've seen and inherited things that might not necessarily be as effective for our employees. 
Uh, my father runs an employee assistance program. I think it's a great idea, but we've really grown a lot since we started doing EAPs and now have new and novel ways to really meet employees where they're at. I think that we have to be responsive. So as an example of an EAP, maybe it's not, um, an innovation that might need to be changed or modified to allow for a new innovation to come in and take its place. Next slide, please. So where does that leave us? Well, I honestly believe that for each of you, it's a really exciting place. Um, as I just I briefly outlined, I think there are four things that employers or actually almost frankly anybody can consider. Number one, we have to address our wrong door problem. We've got to stop expecting people only to go to the place that we've told them they can go for mental health. It just doesn't work. Number two, we've got to redefine what we mean by health and create tools that correspond with that new definition. Um, we need to look as much at community factors for, your, for our employees as we do that their blood pressure. Number three, we need to put standards on it all to assure that we're getting quality care for the people that we serve, to wrap it up in a way that it can be consistently maintained. And number four, and finally, we need to exnovate rid ourselves of the kind of the, the, the weight that we held on from innovation that's been there for someone else's legacy that we inherited. And it's kept us from really being where we need to be, uh, what we need to be doing and where we need to be going. Next slide, please. A consistent theme though, and my challenge to you, um, and it's not named explicitly here, is leadership. Whether that be a leader who aligns and coordinates, a leader who signs something into law that can impact millions, or leadership at the local level where innovation rarely gets a chance to scale and be seen. While people suffer, we must move collectively to action. We must lead. The entire country is learning the power of mental health right now. COVID-19 has forced us to face a level of uncertainty that most of us have never experienced. So I believe that there's no better time than the present to begin to place mental health in the center of our priorities and to invest in solutions that can help us. And while we wait on some of our, our federal friends to do step up and do their job, um, let's be reminded of the power of our employers, what they can do with their voice. It's not a time to be timid on issues of mental health. We're failing with COVID-19. Let's not fail with our nation's mental health as well. So what role will employers play? What's your next best step for mental health? I think that's for you to decide, but let's wait, make it quick as millions of people are waiting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller, and thank you, Dean Murado. And I think we've set this up beautifully because Dean Murado presented a sobering picture of where we are in this pandemic and in the many issues that are causing trauma in people's lives. And then Dr. Miller, you've shown us this global view of how we truly take on the issue of well-being at the level that it deserves. And one of the many people or institutions that need to be engaged our employers. And when Dean Murano and I talked about this, we really wanted to make sure we were bringing relatable employers, you know, small and mid-sized companies and nonprofit organizations that look like a lot of the people on this call from an employment perspective. And so we have two of those organizations that are on the smaller side, but that are truly committed and really thinking about how they can create space and truly support their teams. And the first is going to be Lourdes Gonzalez, who is the Director of People at Farmers Fringe. And so Lourdes, let me turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Seth. And let's get started. Uh, appreciate the great foundation you've set up for us to talk about the practical application. We are Farmers Fridge, uh, next slide. We have reinvented the ability for consumers to get healthy, tasty meals in a convenient and affordable way. Our mission, next slide, is to make healthy food accessible or simple for everyone to eat well. We have, next slide, we started with smart fridges. Uh, so you have a vending machine, you can go in and get a salad, get a sandwich, um, you know, get uh, some snacks. But you can imagine after COVID, within two weeks, our entire revenues were wiped out. And this will be helpful for you to see that our budget when it comes to well-being is either very small or zero. And still, we've been able to accomplish a lot. I'll stop right there to say thank you to my colleagues who are here today, Marie and Pilar. I could have not done this without them. It's a team effort uh, and it doesn't require a lot of money to make it happen. So after COVID, we have launched two new lines of business uh, and we're staying afloat, doing well, uh, because we want our customers to eat a little happier as well as our employees. So at the core, next slide, of what we do in HR is employee experience. Uh, we want to make sure that those moments of truth when our employees most need us, we can deliver on programs that are personalized to them 
and they're actually helpful to their particular need. I'm chatting for everyone an article that I found on what matters today based on Maslow's hierarchy. It's about physical needs, it's about safety, and it's about belonging. So for us, it's connection to the company and it's also how we can better support you from an employee experience perspective to create an employee-centric culture. Next slide. So here are the examples um, I'll ask, um, you know, I'll cover with you. We have a hybrid work model. So that means we have about 130 employees who are reporting every day to a manufacturing plant. So think about the concerns they have as well as their families are very different from our corporate office who's working full remote. So with that said, I'll cover with you the first three things that we identified for our manufacturing plant, feeling safe, Having a sense of normalcy and financial stability were extremely important. Um, some of the examples we have, I'll cover one from each um, area. Uh, we completely revamped off our facilities to be socially distant. Once we had our first couple of cases, we actually, along with a couple of our ops managers and Marie and I, Pilar had not joined yet, uh, we called about 20 employees each to talk to them about their feedback, their concerns, and then reiterate some of the great things that we have done to support their safety and well-being while they were there. Uh, we also launched, in terms of financial stability, um, an app that um, allows employees to get paid daily. It cost us nothing, uh, Marie can tell you. It was a lot of research, uh, but she was able to find a phenomenal solution called Earnin. And then uh, we've done, at the very end, um, pulse surveys. We're doing one right now to see what's next, to listen to our employees and see what's important to them. And then from our corporate office, their needs were very different. They want to feel connected. They want to have a sense of purpose and burnout is a big thing for them. So we got together as a team, as part of the people team. And we did, we use Slack to communicate with each other, to chat uh, instant message. Uh, we, every three weeks, we rotate about 25 employees each and we just do check-ins. How are you doing? Like very individualized, like what's happening. It helps us to strengthen relationships and also find out what the pulse and, and the feel is for when we'll return to the office, which we're not scheduled to do until hopefully um, end of Q2 of 2021. We started new hire 12 month uh, check-ins um, and also stay conversations for that sense, sense of feeling connected. Uh, we did a pulse survey to gather feedback. And then we've also had for the sense of purpose, uh, we have every Wednesday from nine to 12, at heads down, pencils down, no meetings, no calls, no instant messaging for all of us to focus on what's important to continue to drive our strategy, but also feel that we're doing important work. And then last but not least, uh, we've added a couple opportunities uh, for lunch and learns uh, to feature specific teams who are doing things that are, for, for example, our fridges, most of them now are touchless. Uh, so you don't have to go and, you know, get germs off the machine. Uh, you just do it with an app and you're good to go. So we highlighted and featured both in our town hall and then a lunch and learn um, some of the, these great efforts and some of the great ideas that have come out of that. Uh, and then the other piece that's been extremely important uh, for October, well, May, September and October, we've highlighted and provided resources to all of our employees, uh, reminding them on mental and emotional well-being. Uh, things that they have accessible, whether it's our EAP, whether it's article, articles, TED Talks. Uh, I love what Dr. Miller said in terms of it's not your traditional mental health. It's where the different, it's like crowdsourcing for them and making it easy to find and also taking the taboo away from that. So I'll stop there, Seth, uh, unless Marie or Pilar have anything else uh, to say. Um, I have a question. The virtual water cooler is like speed dating. Uh, where we get together, just randomly assign folks to talk in groups of three. And then virtual donut, uh, we do it through Slack. It's a bot where you get randomly matched every Monday at 10. Um, you talk to a colleague uh, you haven't talked to or connected or may not even know. So it's been very successful. We have about uh, 55, 58 out of 100 people who participate. That's our corporate office. We have about 100 people. So with uh, no other questions, um, thank you, Seth. I appreciate the opportunity. And thanks, Marie, and thanks, Pilar, for being part of the team and making all of this happen along with me. Well, thank you so much, Lotus. It is a powerful example because one of the things that Dr. Miller talked about was the stigma sometimes associated with these issues of well-being. And by creating true safe space and being intentional and naming this as a priority as a company, 
and then following through with that level of intentionality. It doesn't cost very much, but it makes a huge difference in people's lives. It reduces that stigma and it creates space that is ultimately allowing your team to be more productive, but even more importantly, allowing them to be healthy. So a great example, and we're gonna move on now to another context, which is a nonprofit arts education organization. Uh, Tanya Haramilla is the COO of Urban Gateways. And Tanya, let me turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Seth. Um, hello, everyone, as uh, Seth said. My name is Tanya Haramia. I am the CEO of Urban Gateways. Um, you can move to the next slide. Where it is our mission to engage young people in arts experiences, to inspire creativity, and impact social change. Uh, we do this through a dynamic arts learning portfolio that connects nearly 100,000 young people with over 200 local teaching artists. Um, and while young people are our primary audience, we also provide workshops for families, uh, co-creation spaces for people of all ages, and professional development training for adults who work directly with young people. Our programs occur in every city ward um, and a handful of neighboring suburbs. Um, and in a shameless plug, because we are a nonprofit, we will be celebrating our 60th birthday throughout 2021. So I really encourage you all uh, to visit us at urbangateways.org to sign up for our newsletter and get invites on events that are coming up throughout the year. Um, and so I think when it comes to employee wellness, you know, we believe in the healing power of the arts. Um, and we know that art and artists are often at the forefront of social movements. And we know that that presence and often the creative work that comes from that space can be really exhausting, particularly for folks of color. Um, our team is impacted directly by this, both as artists and creatives um, and as support and resource providers for those efforts. Compounding that weight with everything we face in 2020, a health pandemic that has shaken our understanding of normal and has disproportionately impacted communities of color in profound and immeasurable ways, a reckoning with white supremacy and the rightful uprising of citizens fighting for equality, all of this on the brink of the most divisive election in recent history. To say that there's work to be done is an understatement. And so when we think about employee wellness, we have to be willing to acknowledge that the convergence of all of these things are hitting people at home, the most sacred of places for so many. This era is blurring the lines between personal and professional, work and school and home. And practically overnight, we went from limiting screen time to working, learning, living, and socializing through digital media. I know for us, the first few weeks of the lockdown, our entire team was in rapid response mode. You see, we were the, the first known case in Chicago Public Schools, happened to be one of our longstanding partners who visited our youth center weekly. And so this caused us to shut down our facility and navigate the very real threat to our team about a week before the city closed and offered any real guidance. We used to joke, that there was no such thing as an arts emergency. And we don't make that joke anymore. Um, as the dust settled and the rest of the world shut down with us, the first thing that we recognized was the need to set boundaries. We have a lot of type A staff members and we knew that just asking folks to take care of themselves was not going to be enough. So we established half day Fridays during the summer so folks could feel empowered to unplug and to get out and enjoy the sun and some fresh air. We set bi-weekly optional check-ins that had no work agenda to it, but instead had prompts such as, what song or color do you feel like today? What are you watching, reading, or listening, listening to that helps your mind unplug and wander? We've even started and ended meetings with breathing exercises, guided meditations, and even silence. And most recently, we are changing our vacation policy to an open PTO policy, which really encourages the team to take the time that they need as they need it. Um, and one of the only stipulations that we've added to that policy 
is that each staff member should take three days off in a row, at least once in the calendar year, to really encourage a truly restful break. And most importantly, we've all adopted the notion of extending grace to ourselves and to each other. And I know the big question is, you know, how do these efforts add value? And so what I'll tell you is our fiscal year ended August 31st. So we spent the second half of our year in lockdown and yet our programs hardly faltered. The team really banded together to shift our programming models to a virtual, uh, to a virtual space. They developed new and engaging opportunities that helped us reach over 70,000 young people by fiscal year end. Given that the year started with a strike at CPS and ended with a perpetual lockdown, we are really, really proud of the impact that we've been able to have this year. We also pushed through the cancellation of our gala and several other fundraising events, but still were able to offer, offer all of our artists on our roster a stipend and the organization was able to end the year with a small surplus. And I think for me, what this shows is that our team is as invested in the organization's well being just as much as the organization is invested in there. And to me, therein really lies the value a team that's committed, engaged, and energized to help our mission become realized. Thank you so much, Tanya. And I just want to affirm that there is so much research behind the idea that healthy people and healthy cultures build healthy performance. And I also just want to say how proud we are because you are a Baumhart scholar and we just uh, are so amazed by what you are doing in the work. And so I want to just say that all of our speakers, I mean, presented such powerful evidence and we're now going to come to your questions. And so Jack Crow, you have our first question and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Seth. Um, in Chicago, we have something called the Corporate Coalition, uh, large, medium, small companies. And we've just formed a resiliency network uh, designed specifically to address um, the well being of employees who've experienced trauma. And my little plug is I invite any of you who are interested in participating in this work to reach out. Maybe, maybe Seth can share some contact information later. But specifically, how, Dr. Miller, how do you see trauma uh, playing into what you talked about with the overall mental health well-being of employees? Let's see, Dr. Miller? All right, well, uh, Dean Morano, you got us started and hopefully we'll see Dr. Yeah, Miller back I here momentarily. Yeah, he may be having video um, problems. On my end, it looks like a black screen, so I'm sure he's fixing it. Okay, so great question around, when you say trauma, you mean um, trauma in the broad sense, right? You know, uh, lifelong trauma? Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I'm not a mental health specialist the way uh, Ben is, but I, I have worked with colleagues in, in public health, mental health, and you raise a very important point. Um, landmark data has shown that early childhood adverse events as, as young as very little uh, shape how we view and respond to the world around us. Um, and um, evidence when we had the Me Too and reoccurrence of trauma around people that may have been sexual trauma, um, as I talk with colleagues and and I invite our other speakers to comment on this as well, you know what we're seeing, what we saw saw over the summer in terms of racial unrest was another form of trauma that just re-triggers um, those old experiences. Um, and I know in talking with people within my school, and I'm curious how the other uh, uh, how you you've done, Tanya and Lourdes, um, there's almost a pushback around, I need a space where I don't have to um, always engage with this, or I want to, as you say, engage with this uh, on my own terms. Um, because uh, for some, that this is traumatizing just to be reliving through some of the things that are going on in the world around us and reminders of social inequities, economic inequities, and all of that. Um, make it difficult. And so I wonder, in, in Ben is now back uh, video-wise, um, we were just being asked around just trauma-informed 
a care or approaches, maybe Ben, your thoughts, so that we can say how Tanya, Laura, how you've approached that in your own work settings. Yeah, apologies for the, the, the weird internet thing there. We're having the storm go through my part of town, so I don't know what, what's going on. Um, it's a great question, and I really appreciate it. And I think Elaine framed it up nicely. I could hear almost everything that you said, Elaine. Just one thing to highlight is that trauma can be experienced individually and at a community level. And I think that that's a really important thing to embrace right now when we consider the context of a lot of the folks that maybe work for us or a lot of the folks that we live next to. So you could go through an individual trauma, you can lose your home, but if your whole neighborhood or community is also burned, that's a very different type of trauma that we collectively feel. And not all of us will recover and, and bounce back the same way. When you look at issues of racism and you look at some of the, the issues around police brutality, I mean, these things we can collectively experience, but some communities experience that trauma more deeper than others. And so I think that we have to acknowledge that because it means that one size fits all will not allow us to fulfill the promise of what equity holds for us, that we have to be much more intentional in how we identify which persons or people might need what and for, you know, for whatever issue it is that they're, they're needing some assistance with. So my advice very, very simply here is that one of the most important things that a, work, a workplace can do to be trauma informed is to acknowledge the fact that trauma is a very real part of most Americans' lives right now, but to not force the conversation, but to embrace the conversation. It's a subtlety that I think is lost sometimes in these nuances. You don't wanna to be too politically correct and you wanna avoid. Well, people need to have discussions right now on how they're feeling. They need to come forward and discuss issues of stress and depression and anger. And if they're not able to do that, then that does not become a safe environment and therefore it can be triggering for individuals that have experienced some of that trauma. So I would say that the easiest place to start is just to embrace the discussion, to acknowledge that it's happening. And then there's obviously wonderful evidence-based programs out there that you can follow, follow suit with, but I'll, I'll leave my colleagues to answer more. Yeah, um, I'll say, you know, for Urban Gateways, we, um, you know, we work with um, a lot of marginalized communities and um, community members and have for the last 60 years. And so um, I would say that, you know, yes, absolutely, you know, to Ben's point, there is a such thing as community trauma, right? Um, there's also something called secondary trauma, right? Where we look at folks who are, um, you know, direct service providers who may not necessarily be uh, experiencing that trauma firsthand, but through their work and their closeness with communities, with folks who are, um, they are receiving some of that and some of those effects. Um, in 2016, our organization actually put our entire staff and um, started putting all of our teaching artists through trauma-informed training. Um, and that has been, you know, incredibly impactful, not just for um, our program approach, um, but also for the way that we operate internally and the way that we operate um, externally, right, with our community and school partners. Um, I think it's incredibly invaluable to have that training and some of that knowledge base. Um, I can share with Seth um, some resources and recommendations for organizations that, that do that training work incredibly well. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, to Ben's point, it really starts, you know, uh, with each individual sort of recognizing that that is a, a real thing um, and then starting to work towards what it looks like to address and dismantle that. Lourdes, anything to add? Yes, I'll add a specific example. When we experienced social unrest last uh, May and over the next couple of weeks, our employees at the manufacturing plant are considered essential workers, and many of them live in areas where they may, they have been looting. Uh, you know, you know, very difficult situation. And at the at the bottom, what I'll say is about trust that your employees trust you and you trust them to do the right thing. Meaning, we offered for anyone to wanted to come to work, Uber paid to get to work and go back home. And there is in the back of your mind, will there be someone who abuses this? Absolutely not. Only the folks who really needed it raised their hand. But at the end of the day is listening to them and knowing what may matter. And it's the one-to-one -one approach that Dr. Miller was talking about. It's not one size fits all. Powerful examples. Uh, Mandy Moody, you have our next question. Mm -hmm. 
Mandy? Yes, thank you. Sorry, it did let me unmute there for a second. Um, so thank you um, to all the speakers for presenting. I've been learning a lot. Um, I, I had sort of a two part question. Um, one, more tactically, Tanya, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about how that unlimited PTO policy works in terms of sort of setting it up. And then also, you know, when staff members leave, is there typically your paid out vacation. So how did you how did you handle that piece of that? Because I'm assuming that doesn't happen anymore with an unlimited PTO policy. And then more broadly, I'm curious to know, I am lead a, a very small staff of four full time people. And so I think that there are times where that makes things easier um, because we, we can be very nimble in, in our approaches here and, and very one on one. But then at the same time, there's challenges with, you know, we have programs that that have to be delivered that other, you know, our clients are, are counting on us for. So there's this push and pull between, you know, really wanting to meet staff where they are and then executing on our mission when there aren't many people to go to for help or for backup or, or just sort of step in. So I'm curious if any of the panelists have anything to offer about how you do make this work well when your team is very small. Yeah, thank you for your question, Mandy. Uh, we grappled with a lot of those same questions, right? Where um, we are a, a little larger than four, but um, we're still fairly small. Um, and so I think, you know, the policy is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, and that's sort of the, you know, the, the, the guideline, right? The, the framework, um, what it looks like in action is something entirely different. And so really what we did was we went to our team, um, and really started engaging in conversations about what their needs are in order for them to fully step away. And what do they need in place? What support networks? What backups? Who's your go-to person so that when you are ready to take the time that you need, you know that you have someone that is ready and willing and able to step into your place to answer any questions that may come through, right? So really sort of setting up, um, you know, a, a, a a 360 degree support network. Um, and then I think, you know, also thinking about, uh, you know, what, 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 you know, vacation normally would get paid out, right? That before we implemented that policy, we were very clear about the fact that that would no longer be a part of our package, right? Um, and we had a lot of conversations again around what that could look like and what that potentially means. Um, but again, it was really about ensuring that we were communicating with our staff um, because ultimately they were the ones who would be the most impacted, right? Um, and then I think too, you know, also thinking that, the open PTO policy isn't necessarily, you know, a way for folks to take six months off and then just pop back in, right? Um, but really looking at it, particularly through the lens of, you know, this current moment in time and thinking, you know, we have a lot of mothers who have young ones at home. And so their day may start at 6 a.m., right? and may not end until nine o'clock at night. And so recognizing that part of this flexible PTO policy is allowing the grace for someone to be able to stop something in the middle of the day to pick up their children, to go to the doctor, to run those errands, right? And so again, it sort of goes back to what Lourdes was saying about this notion of trust, right? And really trusting everyone on the team to do the work that needs to be done um, and still also trusting them to recognize what that looks like it, when they're when they're balancing that time for themselves as well. I also just would add, I love that. I think that was so well said. Um, when you when you talk about flexibility, sometimes it's not just the PTO. It's also when you allow people to do their work hours. You know, I, I've worked with some organizations where. They just decided to experiment and give everybody the Friday off. And they found that they were getting just as much work done by taking another full day off. So it didn't actually decrease productivity. But and so I love that. I think that that's something that needs to be embraced as a, a company culture anyway, especially in 2020, we should all be more flexible. But the second thing I think is almost like this um, a readjustment of sorts of expectations. And we just talked about this. I mean, those of us that have kids at home, you know, you're not gonna be at your best at, at any part of life, if you're not able to take some time for yourself. And I think employers need to recognize that just as much as kids need to recognize that with their parents. 
you know, we're on the 20th Zoom call of the day and there's still homework to be done. So I think that that is actually a conversation that needs to be had. It's not that I see your performance decrease, it's that I'm readjusting my expectations for what, you know, should come from your performance. And it doesn't, it doesn't make excuses for bad behavior. I don't want to get into that. But I really do feel like that's a healthy, almost empowering intervention just to say, I don't think you're going to be 100%. I, if you were 100%, then you must have some like, you know, magic beans in your cabinet that you take every morning that make you have this superpower because I don't know how you do it. I think that's a really powerful and simple way to really hit on your employees. Yeah. As I listen to you all both talk, what really strikes me is how each of you have tailored it to your local, I mean, to your employees' needs, like meeting, as you were saying, Dr. Ben, meeting people where they are. Um, and so it'd be really encouraging all of us to, you know, have those kinds of conversations with our settings. And there may be different innovation that we need to do to, to address it. But the idea is that we're um, probably bringing intentionality to at least have the discussion. And I wonder, I hope that this might carry forward post the pandemic, you know, that we might have a more trusting, flexible, creative kind of work environment. So some of these things we're experimenting with out of necessity might actually carry forward and, and make us better places to work overall. Pilar, you have our next question. Hi hey everyone. Um, I work with Lourdes and Marie at Farmers Bridge. And one of my questions is, how do you make employees feel safe and cared for when they're required to go to work in person while some of their counterparts are working from home? Um, the reason why I ask this is because um, we have half of our workforce is in the production facility, so they have to be at work in person, but you also have an HR team that's there. And then the other half is at our corporate location, like me, and I'm working from home. So how do you make people feel safe and cared for and stay engaged while they may have to show up in person during this pandemic and their counterparts don't. Good question. Thoughts? It's a really, um, yeah, go for it, Tanya. I think some of that, because we, ha we have that situation happening as well, right? Um, I mentioned earlier, we have a youth center and, you know, we have decided to um, open that space up on a project basis. Um, and allow you know some of the young folks to directly connect with the mentors um, to get their projects done. Right, it's a multimedia facility, and so there's you know physical hardware and technologies um, that they need access to in order for them to complete their projects. Right, um, and so it was sort of necessary for us to open that space at least a little bit. Um, and really what we did was we, again, you know, I, I, I can't say this enough. I think it really starts with listening, right? Connecting with the, with the people who are directly impacted and asking what their needs are and how we can help to support them. Um, I think too, you know, we also really um, upticked our cleaning expectations um, and have a cleaning crew that comes in um, every single night that, they're, that they're, someone is in the space. Um, we provide PPE. Um, for everyone in the event that, you know, someone may show up without a mask or, um, <clears throat> you know, to have hand sanitizer. We take temperatures, you know, we have folks check in. We, we sort of follow all of the CDC guidelines as closely as possible. Um, but again, we really also just make sure that we are creating opportunities for folks to continue to participate creatively. Um, both in person and remotely. And so we've done things like, you know, offered uh, hardware on loan so that a young person can come pick it up, take it wherever they need to take it and then bring it back, right? So I think it really is just about being, um, you know, again, communicating and, and, and I think breaking free from a lot of status quo, right? And being okay um, with doing things a little differently. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, go for it, Lourdes. Beth, I'll share three examples for our manufacturing production facility. At the beginning of the pandemic, we shared for employees to take home PPE and hand sanitizer, gloves, masks for their families, for themselves and their families. At the height of it, when we had our first couple of cases, our CEO was in the facility, walking around, talking to people, um, making sure that they were okay, working from there. And we also started a volunteer program if you wanted to go and support our corporate employees, support 
our manufacturing facility. Uh, Marie can tell you she was there chopping apples uh, for one of our salads. Uh, you know, we did it very safely. Uh, and then the third example um, that I have for you, I think it, it has to do a lot with how um, you communicate. So be explicit about what you're doing. So just because you, you think that people understand as parents that they can take the time to communicate it, make sure that you say, it's okay for you. For us in Slack, we'll have folks put like a little icon, like I'm with my children, block your calendar. So communicate those things that way people feel cared for and it's they feel okay they feel that it's not they're doing something that's not inappropriate or, or wrong uh, so that those are some of the things that we've done to balance it out uh, and the other thing i don't know marie if, if you'd like to share that we instituted hero pay for our drivers who had to be dropping off food at the hospitals at the height of the pandemic and also to make up for missed hours for a production facility when our volumes uh, were low so marie any comments on that We may not be able to get her due to muting, um, but uh, I think we'll we'll come back to that. Um, Molly McKiernan, you put something in the chat here that was a suggestion that I thought would be useful to everyone. You got a number of people already echoing it. So <laughs> do you want to share this uh, suggestion live? Sure. Um, Molly McKiernan, I'm the director of HR for AUFL. And what we did, um, we, at the beginning of the remote work, we designated that those that had to have um, specific schedules could do so. And we went to what we call a project-based working method, a remote, we also created a remote work plan that um, and a committee built for the organization so that everyone, we had multiple voices. And it was very like, like we the um, Lords just said, it was very clear to everyone. So we have a woman who's a director who has four small children. So you could imagine what her day is for her and her husband is like. So she could work when she worked best for herself. Say it was 8 to 10 p.m. That was good for her. She, it was perfectly okay for her to do that. We didn't have any designated hours. And she could get her work done, whichever she needed to get during whichever time. So it really freed up people feeling like, first of all, they were trusted by their employer. Secondly, that they could be happy to do the work that they love so much, but do it in the times that they could do it and then really pay attention to their children when their children needed them. Thank you, Molly, for sharing. And thanks to the many others in the chat who have offered suggestions alongside everyone here. We are always amazed by the wisdom in the virtual room alongside the speakers that we planned on. Uh, and let me just throw one final question out to our incredible speakers as a closing, because we've talked a lot about how this should be in every institution and everywhere. And that was that visual that you showed us, Dr. Miller, that really put forward, this is something that we take with us everywhere in our lives. It should be present from an informed, trauma-informed standpoint. So let me ask each of you um, on a personal or professional level, What's one tip that you have for our audience members around how individually we can promote mental health resiliency? And we'll make this popcorn style. So whoever you know wants to pop first can answer and we'll, we'll ultimately hear from all of you. I'll start, I learned from a good friend of mine, whenever she wants to share a concern with me, she will ask me if I have the bandwidth. Are you available? Do you have the bandwidth? Can we chat? And I love that. that's very powerful because then I can say yes or no, or I can say tomorrow. So she's respecting my boundaries, my space. And I've done, I've applied that now at work where I'll say, is this okay? Do you have the bandwidth to discuss this today? Thanks, Lourdes. Well, in that spirit, I'll, I'll share something um, that I, I try to say for myself so that I can be present. Um, I remind myself I'm doing my pandemic best and I am enough um, and try to role model that with others so that um, we, we all are doing enough and we're doing our best and um, give ourselves grace. Thank you, Dean Murata. Um, I think for me, there's, there's two things. Um, I think number one, there is this incredibly great performance artist um, 
that I follow and I love. Um, her name is the Nat Bishop and she runs this initiative, this project called the Nat Ministry. Um, and she frames resting as resistance work. Um, and I really, really love that um, because I do think that oftentimes um, the sort of rat race that we find ourselves in um, is it, it comes from a lot of outside sources and to take the moment to stop and rest for yourself can feel very revolutionary in, in, in the moment. Um, and so I always go to her um, if I feel like I need some, some outside support to, uh, and, and, and permission to rest. Um, and then again, I, you know, I am immersed in a creative work environment. And so, um, and I'm, I'm a bit of a creative myself. And so oftentimes uh, I find that even something as simple as coloring uh, with my four-year-old um, can really provide a, a nice respite. A wonderful example and a very practical one, given all of us have four-year-olds or five-year-olds right around our Zoom right now. Then uh, our final comment. Yeah, so I think the most powerful thing that we can do is to change the culture of health in this country by fully embracing mental health and what it means to each of us, to our communities. And, and that begins at your dinner tables. When you're done with work today and you go home and you're sitting around with your family, your friends, your loved ones, to look at them in the eye and say, how you doing? And to be prepared when they tell you an answer that you may not want to hear. I think that is the, that is the, the, the healing aspect of what's going to get us through this is us being able to embrace one another, to support one another, to listen, to lean in, to love. And it, it's not an evidence-based intervention that I can throw at you that's got these three protocolized things you have to do. It's really this level of empathy that I think we are now having to um, almost re-embrace as a nation. And it begins at your dinner tables and it extends to your workplaces. And every time you could take a moment and just ask someone, how they're doing and really listen to what happens next. I think that's how we change the culture of health and mental health in this nation. Well, this has been an extraordinary conversation. And as someone who sits in the Quinlan School of Business, I'll just close by saying that, you know, I'm constantly struck by the small silver linings in this moment. And one of them is that this very important conversation has always been there but it has not risen to the top of the business playbook until now. And my hope is that now that it has become much more visible within our business discussions and we've become more focused on realizing the role of business in mental health, that as we build back, we build back to a much better normal and that we keep this focus well beyond when it is kind of brought to us by the pandemic. Because as the evidence you showed, uh, this is something that has been going on as a major risk for our entire country well before this pandemic, and we need to be taking it seriously well beyond the pandemic. So thanks to our incredible speakers for giving us the tips to do so. Thanks to the many people in our network who are here, who are sharing their tips alongside, and let us all do our pandemic best, and let us all take the real confidence in being enough. Uh, have a good one, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you back. Thank you.